I saw somebody and I saw you confused and I was wondering why is he confused the Lord said there is a demon that is working against you and in crucial times you just find yourself confused you don't know what to do you just, you just you know, you know what to do before it may be in an exam you know what the answer was but at the right time when you really needed to take action you don't know what to do again and the Lord is dealing with that problem this morning if you are here in the hall come and meet me in front if you are that person if you are online just put your hand on the on your device as i'm going to pray thank you ancient of days i break the power of that affliction in the name of jesus i break the power of that affliction in the name of jesus i break the power of that affliction in the name of jesus I break the power of the affliction in the name of Jesus. I break the power of the affliction in the name of Jesus. I break the power of the affliction in the name of Jesus. Thank you, ancient of days. Thank you, giver of life. I celebrate you, the only one who is mighty. There is no one like you. Power belongs to you. Dominion is yours. We don't worship you. So that you can be great you cannot be greater than what you are you are greater than the greatest you are already great on your own we worship you so that we can be great father you are unchangeable mighty one <laughs> the great one the residue of power the owner of all things we celebrate you this morning Thank you for being our strength. Thank you for showing your mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us a, a, a beautiful morning. Some people sent cloud to us this morning. And I told you, that will not be very good for us now. And you change it for us. Thank you, ancient of days. We are grateful for your kindness. Thank you for making things to work for us all the time. Take all the glory. Take all the glory. Let your name be exalted forever. I pray that you open our understanding to your word. Impart our destinies. Thank you, Lord, for answer prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Even if it was me, if I'm God, I won't accept that praise. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please sit down in the presence of God. I want to welcome you to the presence of God this morning. I know that God is here with us. And I know he's going to bless you. Okay, he's going to bless me. Every time I come before God, I'm waiting for an expectation. I'm waiting for a blessing. I have an expectation of a blessing. I know he's going to bless me. Now, you know that blessing is not always money. Blessing is never, it's not always monetary. There are different dimensions of blessings. I think some, someday I will, teach, I will tell you a little bit about blessings. There are, you know, we know them, but we don't pay attention to them. Blessings are in layers, layers of blessing. Anyhow. Let me focus on the work of today. Those of you who came for Segomido, go, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I believe that the next one will be greater than the one we just did. 
And like I said, I trust God that we will build uh, a hall this size over there. And I, I'm trusting God we will have finished it by July. I know, I know, I'm trusting God. I know we will do it. God will help us. And I'm not going to take one single offering for it. We will just, we will just do it. Because he has enabled us. That is over there. But here also, I'm trusting God for some new things. The new things are going to begin to happen. I just felt I should prophesy a little bit. I've always been prophesying to you. I'm prophesying to the ministry now. That new things are coming. I had a visitation in the week and the Holy Spirit came visiting me and he gave me specific informations. There were four of them. As I step out of that revelation, number one was accomplished. I said, this is a serious matter. <laughs> Don't worry. Open your Bible with me to Second Timothy chapter 1. And I will read verse 7 to you again. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. You know for some time now I've been talking about, I mean I've been using that scripture. And I expect that by now you already know that scripture. And you begin to meditate more on that scripture. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. The day you are free from the spirit of fear, you begin to soar. Most of us are battling with the spirit of fear. Fear, fear, fear. And many things we do in life are dictated by our fears. Fear, fear. But do you know that that is the that is the level of the animalistic capacity of man. It's animals that operate at that level. Let me put this in a simpler form. Animals operate by fear. They operate by circumstances around them. But we are better than animals. We shouldn't live our lives by fear. We shouldn't operate by circumstances around us. We should operate from within, 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 and from above. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. My major focus in the messages I've been doing is on sound mind. Sound mind. Now, the topic of my message today is choice making number six now. That's my message today. And uh, there's another aspect to that. I will add it as I get further. Now, decision taking is a very important subject. I've said that repeatedly. And that comes up to us everywhere we go. Yesterday, we were in a minister's meeting in Aye uh, Toro. And one of the questions that came up was, how do I know the voice of God? <laughs> this subject is a major subject and it goes beyond any class. Everybody wants to know the voice of God. How do I know when God is speaking to me? How do I hear him correctly? Or better still, how do I take my decisions? Now, God gave you a sound mind. In preparation for the responsibility of choice making, he gave you a sound mind. God knows that you need to take several decisions in life. So, the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, he gave you a spirit. And in that spirit... There is sound mind. So it is always very good for you 
as a believer to allow God to help you take the right decisions, the di particularly in difficult situations. But it's not every subject that God would speak to you about. It's not every time you need to do everything that you would need to speak to God. As a matter of fact, 95% of the decisions we take, or maybe I should say 99% of decisions we take, we don't need to hear the voice of God about them. Or we rather don't hear the voice of God about them. God doesn't get involved in every decision you are taking. No, he doesn't. He gave you a sound mind. So that you can take some of your decisions by yourself. What am I trying to say? This morning as I was doing my uh, devotion, all of a sudden, the sky changed. That should be around 6.30, there about. The sky, it started by being bright, and then it just became cloudy. And I said, ah, today is going to be a wet day, a cold day. Even though we dealt with the wind, no, no, wind, I don't want you. I cannot say rain should not fall. Wind, don't disturb us. We are worshiping our God today. Dealt with that. But I knew it was going to be a cold day. And instantly, my dress plan for this morning changed. I knew I needed to wear a warmer clothes. Am I, am I speaking for you? Is that not what happened to you also? When you see the cloud change, you see a cold day is coming. It dictates the kind of clothes you wear. Did you ask the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, move me now. What clothes should I wear? Speak unto me again now. No. I just decided straight away that my clothes must be warm this morning. What dictated that decision for me? Upbringing. My mama taught me when I was small that when the weather is cold, you wear warm clothes. No be so. And as I grew up and began to take decisions by myself, I have taken it wrongly sometimes. And I came back defeated. <laughs> so, experience also taught me that when the weather is cold, you wear warm dress. I didn't speak to God about it. I didn't ask his opinion on it. I just took the decision. When you are driving on the road and all of a sudden the other vehicle drive in your direction. Do you speak in tongues? What do I do? What do I do, Lord? What do I do, Lord? By the time you are still doing what you are doing, <laughs> he already hits you. <laughs> So instantly you jive off the road for the idiot to pass. <laughs> before he would uh, dent your vehicle or before he will hit you, you have cleared out of the road for him. You don't need direction on those ones. Your sound mind helps you to take decision about them. In essence, I'm trying to show you that the most, the, the, most of the time when we take decisions... The decisions have nothing to do with God. It's your mind, your sound mind that helps you to decide. And that's why I'm focusing in that direction. In these messages, we are talking, we are looking at direction. Of course, we are looking at here taking decisions. There are two dimensions to decision taking. There's the aspect of sound mind and there's the aspect of direction. But I'm trying to show you that the, you know, most times when, you do, when we do teachings, we focus only on the direction. Direction. Hear the voice of God. Hear, but the hearing of the voice of God is only for a few times. 
Most of the decisions you take are by your sound mind. If your sound mind is in order, then the direction will be all right. And I've tried to show you over the past messages that even when you are receiving direction, sometimes a number of factors affect those decisions. That's why you see some men of God who will tell you that dancing is, is a sin. They tell you it's a criminal thing to dance in the spiritual realm. And if you come to a meeting where they are presiding and you are dancing, you are on your way to hell. I had a friend like that. Each time he came, and my people are drumming, he just, because he has to dance, he will just be doing his hand like this. <laughs> and many times I hit him, I say, dance now. He can't dance. Because he doesn't believe that dancing is a part of God. He's reading the same scripture that we are reading. And my own understanding is different. I dance before God. In fact, sometimes when I forget to dance, God is asking me, you didn't dance today. But to him, God hates dancing. Because he's European. I am African. <laughs> hey, the Lord will help you in Jesus' name. So I'm trying to show you that oftentimes we are limited by our idiosyncrasies, our, our personalities, our uh, uh, experiences. They affect the voices we hear, the directions we receive, even when we begin to receive direction. That's why the Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That is, if you pour water in a bottle, it will take the shape of a bottle. If you pour water in a keg, it will take the shape of a keg. If you pour the same water inside a flat plate, it will become flat. When the spirit comes upon a man, the spirit is limited by that man. When direction also comes, it tends to be limited by your personality. Let me go to the work of today. I'm still doing preamble, all kinds of preamblings, so that you will understand what I'm trying to say. God does not want you to be a robot. I'm a father, for instance, and I have, I have, what do I have now? I have children. They can't, I can't call them kids again, so that they won't sue me to court. But I have children. When they were young, they take they ask me questions about almost everything. Can I do this? That is, should I do this? And I will give them instructions. Now, but now they are grown up. They don't need me to ask questions. Unless in critical situations. In fact, sometimes, even me, I will ask them, on this subject, what can I do? And they are the one instructing me now. You get what I'm talking about? And I feel proud. Am I, am I speaking for you? Yes. Your children, they grow, they become more intelligent than you in a number of areas. Because of exposures that they have, that you don't have. Alright? The same way God expects you to be able to take decisions without him on many things. That's why some things you ask God, he won't even answer you. Because he's wondering, don't you know that? Wouldn't you know what to do on that? I'm a father. If my son wakes up in the morning and he says, Excuse me, daddy, should I wash my mouth? You know my children now. I don't need to call any one of them. Picture one of them. Wake up in the morning and say, and knock on my door. Hello, daddy. Good morning. Should I wash my mouth? I will start prayer. Because that, that means something has happened in his brain. I shouldn't be excited that my son is close to me 
He's asking me whether he should wash his mouth. Why do you think God wants you to come and ask him questions on every subject? No, he doesn't. There are some things he expects you to be able to take your decision on. That's why we are talking about sound mind. So this morning, the focus I have is, can't, I call it, can't one to ten and win. So you can say choice making part five or part six, count one to ten and win. That is, there are some ten questions that you can ask yourself when you want to take a major decision. Ask yourself the following ten questions. And the answer you get would assist you to take right decisions. So I call it count one to ten and win. Sometimes it is one of the questions that will solve the problem. Sometimes you may need to ask all the ten questions. Depending on how complex the decision, the subject is. Number one, is it lawful? That thing you want to do, is it lawful? If you get reported or you get caught, will you go to jail for it? You know, the word of God frowns against any action that is unlawful. And that's what Jesus was trying to explain when they asked him, should they pay tax? He said, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. So, except in a situation when the law of your nation confront the word of God, you should take your decisions in reference to the law of your nation. So, anything that is contrary to the law, don't do it. If what you are trying to do is unlawful, don't do it. But if it is lawful, then it had passed the first test. I'm trying to show you how to take decisions with your sound mind. The first thing is, is it lawful or is it unlawful? That's number one. Number two, does it benefit me? Do you stand to benefit anything from doing what you are planning to do? Or will it hurt you? And one area where that manifests most in my own life is in relationships. Because from time to time, I review my relationships. And every relationship that is not of benefit must go. Check it up again. Check it up again. This fellow, what am I gaining from that relationship? What is the relationship about? If I discover that the relationship is not, it's not beneficial, the relationship is not achieving anything serious, I begin to change my gears. I change gear. I begin to change gear. Does it benefit me? That's the second question you should ask yourself. Is there any benefit I derive from this decision? That thing I want to do, do I benefit from it? How much benefit am I going to gain? Very, very crucial. Number three, does it benefit others? Sometimes, some things you want to do may not benefit you, but it benefits other people. You know, as a believer, we... We, we are meant to be self, I mean, we, we are meant to be selfless and shift attention from ourselves. 
He said, I, Beloved, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So sometimes, most times, what we do is not meant to be for our benefit. It's for the benefit of other people. But that's not limited to believers, you know. I have discovered that if you set up your business to meet the need of people, your business will do so well. If your, if your business is focused on feeding your family, it will not go far. Want to, you just want to feed your family. Uh, eh, you'll be selling bread now. Selling bread beside your house. Because your interest is just feeding yourself, your family, your children, your this. Your, it will limit your life. But the moment your focus is meeting needs of plenty people, then you begin to rise. The more you are meeting needs of people, the larger you become. So number three, does it benefit other people? Most of the things that God expects you to do may not benefit you directly, but it will benefit other people. Like when God told us to start a school over there, he wasn't thinking about our benefit. If he was thinking about our benefit, the structure would be different. The operations would be different. The interests would be different. It's not our benefit. It's the benefit of other people around us. So sometimes, or most times, God will be leading you to do things to benefit other people. When you give your car out, it may not be for your immediate benefit. It may be for the benefit of another person. When you give an offering, it may not be for your immediate benefit. You're giving it for some other people. For the work of God. And I said, if all your actions are decided to center upon your benefit, you'll be a dangerous or bad person to be with. You'll be a dangerous person to be with. Everything you are doing in life is for your benefit. Ah. Then you'll be a dangerous person. Because you can do anything. So, does it benefit other people? That's number three. Number four. Is it of immediate benefit or long-term benefit? There are some things that look like they are not benefiting you. But that's just in the immediate. In the future, they are going to be very, 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 very benefiting. In the future. But right now, there's nothing serious that you are benefiting from it. For instance, I spoke about giving out a car. I've had to do that a number of times. When you are giving out a vehicle, you don't benefit. In fact, you are going to lose. It's painful. Particularly if the vehicle you are giving is the, is the only one you have. Remember when God said we should give out the Pathfinder and then I started going on Okada. It was not fine. Ah, it was not beneficial. It was not. And for two years, there was no vehicle at all in this company. And many times, ah, I know the, I, my wife is an expert. She knew the names of all the Okada riders around and their phone number. So when I'm going out, or taxi driver, we will call in them. Hello? Mbulewa. Shelewa. Shelewa. It wasn't very pleasant, you know. In the immediate. But when the result came, ah, I said, I should have done that thing long ago. I should have done. I didn't know is this beneficial. So benefiting. I didn't know. Sometimes 
the benefit is not in the immediate. It's a long-term benefit. For instance, going to school or learning a trade. When you are going to school, you don't experience, you don't know the benefit of it. You don't know it. You, you, you're just going. Your parents are pushing you. Go to school. Oh, yeah, my Lord. You know, you need to see kids when they are taking them to school. You will think it's a war. Love, love, love. And they will drive him like they drive animal to school. Even when you get to the high institution, it's still not benefiting. Is it benefiting? You wake up in the morning, you look at the sky, you say, ah, he let you have more. Oh. But you force yourself into it. You force yourself. You just keep on going. You just keep on going. Until the day you begin to benefit from it. And they begin to pay you salary. You go to work in a place and people who are older than you are greeting you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. And you, have, you become sir. Just like that. The moment you appear. My wife was the head of the department of one department that she worked the last time. She was the youngest person in the place, but she was the old guy of the place. All the people were, there were some of them who could give birth to her. And when she comes, they're like, ah, Madam, we're welcome, ma. We're welcome, ma. That's what going to school does to you. When you begin to speak in some gathering, when you begin to move with some groups of people, then you, up, you understand the benefits of your going to school. So, those things are not immediate benefits. They are for long-term benefits. It's the same thing when you are learning a trade. You are learning. I went to a mechanic shed. And one of his boys had misbehaved and they are talking to him and they are flogging. I said, ah. So I began to talk to the boy. He didn't know what he was doing. He is tired of the thing. But a time is coming that you're going to, your life will depend upon this thing you are learning. There's a benefit in the future, but not now. When you are learning the trade, they flog you, they do all kinds of things. But you put yourself through it because of the future benefits. So I'm saying that there are some decisions that when you want to take them, you have to think about the future before you know what to do. Every farmer understands what I'm talking about. There are some crops that will yield you harvests quickly like corn what again huh amaragos arabunie gelie gelie vegetables ni amaragos amaragos ko okay Plantain and all those kind of things. They yield immediate benefits. But when you plant cocoa, for instance, that will benefit you on the long run. The first six, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten years, you are not taking any serious benefit from it. But after ten years, Yes, depending on the kind of uh, cocoa you planted. After like six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, then your harvest comes. It comes heavily and you begin to enjoy it. Farmers know that. We must know that also. Therefore, when something is not benefiting now, you may still not discard it. Because there may be some long-term benefits inherent. So sometimes when you are deciding how to spend your money as a couple, 
and you have the option of buying a land and you have the same option of eating good food and you want to decide which one should I decide which one should we do oh you as a lady you want to use pampas for your kids and the husband also is talking of you want to buy land and you need to make a choice yes pampas is good it's good to it's good to spend your money on your pupu on your children's pupu it's good very good because you gave birth to them and you are rich <laughs> but before you waste all the money and you want to also buy land think about the benefit that land will give you in the future and then you go in that direction that's number four is it of immediate benefit or long-term benefit number five has it happened before and what was the result then that subject you want to take a decision about has it happened before because there's nothing new under the sun what you are trying to do had been done before in history so and if it had been done before in history it may be good for you to learn from the ex ex experience of those who have gone ahead of you now that's one of the major reasons why we read it's good to read and read history read biographies read stories of people who have gone ahead of you it might be good to do a research in history find out the results they got on various actions that they took when that subject was first done what happened so that what you you know what you're about to do will not turn you into a casualty of history let me give you an example there was a man called alexander the way he was a great preacher in the 18th century is it 18 or 19 now i'm not sure but he was such a great man of god great man you know something about life something about this world is that the world swallows people there was a time those people were names that you mentioned and everybody is running but today I mention him and I need to be defining who he is and explaining to you. you. Some of you never heard about him before. A time is going to come that some people will hear my name also and they will never have heard it before. Your name also. There's a time, a time is coming that all the record of the world, all the world we have about you is just that thing they write at the, the tomb, the tombstone, you know, tombstone now. We just put it there. He was a preacher. And that would be the end. What else will you write there? He was a preacher. What else? <laughs> he was a preacher. He was this. He was that. The space is too small that you don't even have. You can't write everything. So you just write one statement or two statements. And that's the rest that the world will know about him. History. You must learn from history. People have gone before you. Food. Ah, people have eaten plenty. They ate. Land took it from them. Immorality. Ah. You think you are an expert. Go and ask Solomon. In sleeping with women. Ha! Solomon had 1,000. 1,000. How many do you have that you think you are somebody in sleeping with people? Solomon had 1,000. All of them legitimate. <laughs> There's no illegitimate out of the 1,000. I have always wondered how Solomon remembered the names of, of those women. 1,000 of them. 
Somebody will come, you say, no, it's, it's not your jockey I'm calling. <laughs> jockey number three. <laughs> plenty, plenty women. So the question is, has it happened before? I was talking about Alexander the Way. Alexander the Way built a city, called it a holy city. That city was called Zion, Zion City. It was a holy city. It's a Christian city. They don't want sin in that town. No sin. <laughs> no devil in that town. Nobody. No demon possessed person can enter the place. They wanted to replicate the new Jerusalem on earth. It was great. But the way died as a miserable man. Because his city was a failure. It was a failure. It was not holy. In fact, it was so bad that uh, the entire world reported the failure of Zion City. He died a miserable man because his city was a failure. A. A. Allen also did it. He built a place also like that and he ended with similar results. So, now if God is, if you find yourself wanting to build a Christian city, Go and do an historical research into that. Read about those who have done it before you. That research may not stop you, but it will help you to avoid their own errors in decision taking. So it's good to check in history. Has it been done before? This thing you want to do, has it been done before? You have a business plan, check it up. Has somebody done it before? It will help you in taking a wise decision. There is nothing you are doing that has not been done before. You can ask questions from those who have done it. It will help you in taking your decision. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, as we lift our hands before you as a token of our love. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, as I lift my hand. Before you as a token of my love, holy, 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 holy. The Lord is showing me a group of people who are in traps, traps of the prophets. A prophet said this, and that have dictated what happened in your life. You have been battling with it because that prophet said, and you have been battling with it. There's another group, your own is not prophet said, your own is prophet did. Some prophet did something in your life, and that have hindered you, it has become a major problem in your life. I'd like you to just put your right hand on your head. I'm going to pray for you. Everyone who is under such kinds of captivity, I command your release this moment. In the name of Jesus. 
I break the power of that limiting force over your life. Be free in the name of Jesus. I said be free in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus.